Hi. Um, all right, so let's talk about Carpe Diem poetry. Um, so today I'm going to go over to his Koi Mistress um, by Andrew Marvell, to the versions to make much use of time by Robert Herrick, and The Sun Rising by John Donne. Um, this, of course, is our reading for uh, Tuesday, February 24th, um, and the poems that we didn't quite get to. Um, I will make a separate video to talk about uh, Dr. Faustus, um, but this is the first one. The, I want to start with uh, Robert Herrick's poem, To the Virgins, to make much um, of time, because it is kind of the classic example of a Carpe Diem poem. And as I mentioned to you, Carpe, Carpe Diem poetry um, is poetry that um, talks about seizing the day, right, because that's what Carpe Diem means. Um, and there were certain poets who um, urged people to live in the now, right? Um, these poems were written during a period of time um, that was quite contentious. As we discussed, um, there were, um, th th there was a lot of political instability um, during the period. Let me just look up to the virgins um, to check the date. Um, I just looked this up just a minute ago. Um, what date it was. It was the 17th century, but it doesn't tell us. Okay, 1648 is the day that, or is the time um, this poem was published. Um, and in 1648, I believe, that is the same year that um, King um, Charles was, let's look at this, dual slides. I believe King Charles was dethroned then, or he was very um, near the time in which um, we have the destabilization of <coughs> the monarchy um, and, you know, the installation of the Commonwealth of England. So let's just check that really quickly. I don't want to give you the wrong date. We just went over this and okay so 1648 um, is right around the time it was well the beheading of king charles happens in 1649 um and of course like my presentation says right here um it was a cataclysmic event um but this he, he is beheaded in 1649 um and the contention happens uh, much before 1649. Um, there's act actually um, in 1642, Parliament votes to raise an army, um, and England is in a civil war some, from 1642 to 1646. Um, and at the end of that, they behead um, the King of England and install the Commonwealth. So there's lots of instability during this time. You can imagine what it is like to live during a time of civil war, um, in your own country, right? So the war is going on in your country and there's political factions fighting um, that really, you know, makes you think life is short, right? Um, you know, if what are, what are you living for? Um, and when you have significant loss or you see significant loss in life, oftentimes you reevaluate um, your life and what's important to you. Um, and you, and it's not all that shocking that during this time frame we have this poetry um, that urges people to seize the day, to, to do what they want, to enjoy life because it is short. Um, so let's start here. And Robert Herrick has a very classical example of um, that kind of sentiment. Um, so gather ye rosebuds while ye may, old time is still a flying, and the same flower that smiles today, tomorrow will be dying. 
So what is beautiful now will fade and die. The glorious lamp of heaven, the sun, the higher he's a getting, the sooner will his race be run and nearing he's to setting. So we're, you know, you can't be beautiful your whole life. You can't live forever. You're not immortal. Um, death sat your back and of course this has a, a a different feeling if you know the england and civil war the age is best which is the first when youth and blood are warmer but being spent the worse and worse time still succeed the former so there's this idea that and i and i think you probably can um sympathize or empathize with it that when you're young um, things are fun and uncomplicated um, and you know you have a fiery passion for life when you start getting older taking chances are there's there's more risk involved more to lose so it's kind of recalling that passage of time um, but also privileging the, the youth your youth um, so he comes to the proposition of the Carpe Diem poem, then be not coy, but use your time. And while ye may go marry for having lost, but once your prime, you may forever tarry. So um, urging um, people to marry, urging people to, um, you know, hook up um, because you, you're going to get old. Um, you're going to die. You don't want to die alone. Um, or you may die before you find the person. Um, so this is really a classical example. Um, and it's A, B, A, B. May, today, flying, dying, um, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, H, G, um, H. So we have four stanzas one stanza two three four so two lines short of a sonnet but that is following enter um or or um an a one and three pattern so the first line rhymes with the third line the second line rhymes with the um a fourth line but there is no interlocking structure like we see with uh spencer or chaucer um or their terzorima Okay, so um, I, I start with this poem because it's rather uncomplicated um, and it's a little risque, right? Um, and let's move now to his coy mistress, which is a little bit more complicated. I asked some of you to write about whether or not you thought that this poem was, was straight faced or was it tongue in cheek? Um, was it kind of parodying the poems like um, Herrick's To the Virgin? Um, you know, Andrew Marvell, along with Herrick, are considered what we call cavalier poets. Um, let's just look that up. I'm not spelling cavalier, right? There we go. Um, the cavalier poet. Um, is a school of English poets in the 17th century that came from the classes that supported King Charles I during the English Civil War. Um, Charles, a connoisseur of the fine arts, supported poets who created the art he craved. Um, a cavalier was traditionally a mounted soldier or knight. Um, you know, so Robert Herrick, um, Thomas Carew, Sir John Suckling, Richard Loveless, um, they're all considered um, cavalier poetry characteristics. Um, let's see, simple gratification of, of celebratory things um, <clears throat> that are much livelier than traditional works. Um, so we, we look at this and, and kind of think about how this is about simple pleasures, right? All right, so let's look at a complication of this um, to his quay mistress. So although this poem um, does not is not using spacing, there are one, two, three stanzas 
Um, and those three stanzas have a logical form. I mentioned to you that we need to start thinking about how poems are organized in the same way that we think about how essays are organized or how books are organized in chapters. The stanza is kind of like a chapter um, or a paragraph, if you will. Um, and, and sometimes you can try to figure out some sort of logical um, organization. In this poem, there is a logical organization. So had starts the first stanza, but starts the second stanza, and now starts the third stanza. This is, um, is an argument structure. So you say if or had, so we don't say had we anymore. We say if we. So if we had enough time in the world, um, I would do these things for you. But we don't, because he says, but at my back, I always hear times when you chariot hurrying near. So it means what we don't, you're going to die. Um, and he goes on with lots of imagery of death and of the tomb um, and the, not only the death of the physical body, but the death of love. Um, and then he launches in to the last part of the argument, which is therefore. So if we had all the time in the world, but we don't, death is coming, therefore sleep with me. So, um, you know, join together and let's make our own time. So let's go through and talk about um, this really rich poem. One thing to mention about this poem is it's written in iambic tetrameter. Um, I know we've been talking about iambic pentameter a lot. This is iambic tetrameter. You can think about, you know, what, what are the ramifications of using um, that meter? Um, the other thing is the rhyme scheme um, are, is, is this couplet rhyme scheme. So we have time, crime, way, day, side, tide, wood, flood, refuse, Jews, grow, slow, praise, gay. So it's very melodious um, and it um, kind of has a certain um, flow, right? All right, so let's let's break this further down. Had we but world enough in time, this coyness lady were no crime. Now, coyness, um, let's look up the definition of what coy means because I think it's really important. Um, so, um, making a pretense of shyness or modesty that is intended to be alluring. Um, now, modern definitions say coy is a pretense of shyness or modesty it's kind of like hiding something else whereas the dated version of this word means just quiet and reserved um, it's really important that you think about this word as the older definition the quiet and reserved the shy definition um, and let's just check um, the Oxford English Dictionary while we're doing this um, to look at when um, that's that secondary or the connotation of coyness comes into the language so we're going to go to databases I'm going to go down here to the Oxford English Dictionary And of course you have access to this as long as you are on campus. And we're gonna type in coy right here. If you're off campus, you can still also have. Um, all right, here we go, adjective. We wanted to look at as an adjective, not as a noun or a verb. All right, quiet still, chiefly to bear, to hold, to keep to oneself, which is an obsolete um, definition of things, quiet, not demonstrative, shyly reserved, 
um, of actions, behaviors, looks. Um, Okay, here's the one to make it coy to affect reserve shyness or disdain. Um, that's obsolete, lascivious. That's not what we're looking for. Okay, so the secondary definition, um, unwilling to commit oneself about a matter, it doesn't come into the language until 1961. Um, let's see. Let's look at the other one here. No, that's it. Okay, so that, that secondary definition to play like you are um, versus have like kind of like deception is is not in the original um, definition of the word and is not being used in the time frame that this poem is written. Um, the affect, to affect, reserve, um, it's not something that that is used. So you need to make sure that you look the definition up of how things are being used. Okay, so back to the to the this coyness lady. So this reserve um, would be no crime. So he's saying it is a crime because we don't have enough time. But he said if we had enough time, it wouldn't be a problem. Um, I would. Um, sit down and pass our love longs day. You by the ending Ganges side, um, should rubies find, and I by the tide of the Humber would complain. I want you to pay attention to the um, the the place locales here. The Humber River is in Northumbria in England. Um, of course, the Ganges um, um, are is on the Indian subcontinent. So we are. Um, talking about you can pass along on on this river's side um, while I'm here in England so we're collapsing space that these two can be um, in a relationship it doesn't matter how far away they are um, they can they can you know, spend their time finding um, you know beautiful things and dwelling or doing or not that's what's the word I'm looking for um, taking their time to court one another, right? Um, I would love you 10 years before the flood. So first we, we've collapsed geographic space. And the second part of this stanza, we're collapsing time. Um, I would love you 10 years before the flood and, and you should, if you please, refuse to the conversion of the Jews, which happens at the end of time, at the end of the world, according to biblical understanding and mythology. Um, and then he says, my vegetable love should grow vaster than empires and more slow. A um, hundred years should go to, okay, uh, let's start with the vegetable love. Um, vegetative love um, is something that is natural. Um, it is something that is slow to grow, um, and it is something that is pitted here against vaster than empires and more slow. Um, so there's this imagery that's being invoked of, of um, vegetative, um, you know, vegetation overtaking um, ruins and empires and this idea that you know something that has been built um, and mastered like the woman's re refusal um, to to engage with him um, can be penetrated if you will for like better terms by his vegetable love or the natural persistence of of the world of the earth um, so that that image is pretty um, packed also there's phallic imagery there um, and but you know natural vegetative 
um, imagery is overtaking something that is constructed, that's something that is artificial, that does not belong in the landscape. These um, empires that have been built upon the natural earth. Um, the next part says a hundred years um, should go to praise your eyes um, and on your forehead gaze 200 to a tour each breast but 30,000 to the rest and I think this is a, this is one place that you could um, talk about that this is kind of a tongue-in-cheek um, poem if you wanted to make that argument that you know he's talking about um, he, again, he's collapsing time. He, he's also playing with the tradition of the blazon um, that we've talked about, chopping up the female body into parts and comparing different parts of the female body hyperbolically um, to, you know, um, elements that that are um, luxurious or exotic we see this in the love poetry of the 16th century of the 15th century of the 14th century we've talked about this um, but he's talking about doing it for an extraordinary long amount of time um, to look at the eyes and on the forehead and then what's kind of funny is he's like i'm going to spend a um, hundred years on one breast and a hundred years on the other breast which kind of gives you a chuckle um because it also suggests you know a hundred you know or i mean sorry he says 200 to your door each breast um which kind of belies you know this kind of sexual urgency because he's only spending a hundred on the eyes and the forehead um and then thirty thousand, he just lumps it all together to for the rest an age at least to every part at last to every part and the last age should show your heart for lady you deserve the state and and i wouldn't love it any lower rate so um he's he's established if we had this i would do all these things for you um and i would take my time but we don't um and we're transitioning to the next part of the poem we do not have that amount of time and um I actually hear times being chariot, which is, um, you know, a personification of, you know, the passage of time with the chariot that draws um, the sun across the sky every night. Um, and he's hearing this at his back um, and it's persistent. Um, and it's something that is, is, is building tension within the poem because it's pushing him forward and yonder all before us lie deserts of vast eternity eternity um, and you can tell there that some, the early modern speech is different than um, modern speech lie in eternity um, that there would have been a different pronunciation during that time because this is supposed to rhyme um, and so we have you know this vegetative natural exotic imagery that has just been invoked in the first stanza and then we have kind of a pressing um of you know death imagery at his back um and then said yonder before us lie deserts of eternity um the beauty would be no more found um, in, in her body and then we turn to a very dark place talking about uh, um, you know the de de or the decomposition of the physical body um, no beauty will be found in your grave in your marble vault um, no um, echoing sound it says um, you, you can't refuse me no one will hear you um, you, I the the vault will not contain my echoing sound my persistence um, and then this part that's really kind of disturbing that he says worms shall try that long preservative virginity you're going to die you're going to be a virgin um, and you know the worms will go in the orifices and that's exactly what he's talking about there and then there's a double entendre here with the quaint, which we saw in the Canterbury Tales, which has a, a doubled meaning, right? So the quaint honor. So um, quaint meaning outdated. Um, it means something that is 
um, complex, but it also has the double meaning of the the um, the c word. Um, it's so it is playing on um, the literal um, quaint honor um, and also the 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 quaint honor that has to do with being outdated that she is resisting the advances it's going to turn to dust because her physical body is going to turn to dust um and as well when her physical body is gone his persistence his adoration will also turn to dust um and then the, the my favorite lines are the graves of fine and private place but none i think do there embrace these lines so so clever um it's saying that you know you can you know you can protect your body it's private um you can have your own place and space but no one's no one's doing anything in the grave um and you'll be alone and dead all right then we move to the last part um now therefore while the youthful hue sits on your skin like morning dew um and he talks about a, a juxtaposition from that previous stanza where he's invoking kind of decay um death decomposition grayness he's talking about um you know the skin that is like a morning dew it's glistening they're dewy um and there's a fire that's burning um with that within every pore of his body right um while the willing soul transpires at every pore with instant fires so she's alive um, our passion is alive. My passion for you is alive. Um, and like, and now like amorous birds of prey, um, it, which is a strange combination of violence and sexual desire, rather at once our time devour than languish in his slow chat power. That's a reference to um, time again. Um, don't let time devour us, that time that's at our back. Um, and, and, and decompose in his, in his slow burning power. Instead, let's roll all our strength and sweetness up until one ball, um, and tear our pleasures with rough, rough strife. There's lots of sexual imagery there of, you know, Shakespeare's beast with the two back, right? So there, let's join and be one. Let's, let's wrap ourselves up in one another. Um, and then the famous last lines, if we cannot make our son stand still, we will make him run. If we can't stop time, um, we'll make it speed up, right? We'll make him run. So, um, he's no longer at the back that they're in command of time. Um, so that's, I want you to think about whether or not you think that that's tongue in cheek. I think it's a powerful poem. Um, it makes an interesting argument. Um, but it also it has some of the most famous lines within it. Um, but at my back, I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near, um, and yonder all before us lie deserts of vast eternity. Those are very famous lines that you might find on an ID test um, for the GRE, um, or if you're going to take the Praxis. These last lines are also very famous. Um, so know that. Let's move on to John Donne's um, Sun Rising. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this um, because we've spent so much time on John Donne already. Um, but this is in the tradition of the Abad, which is a, a poem that is written to, excuse me, parting lovers at sunrise. And this is in a long tradition. I know you think I'm just obsessed with like medieval poetry or whatever, but it is a classical um, motif that we see um, in, in classical writing, but also in medieval writing where lovers, usually illicit lovers, those are lovers that are not supposed to be paired up, um, 
must part when the sun rises, before the sun rises, to, you know, go to their various homes and be safe so they won't be found out. So um, he's invoking that that um, genre of poetry or that form of poetry, if you will, um, by by writing in that style. So he addresses the sun outside his window. And I know we talked the other day about the Ptolemaic um, idea of the universe um, and the earth um, and the, in the, in the spheres, right? So Galileo, um, as I mentioned in my um, presentation to you the other day, um, challenged the idea of a um, like an earth centric form, um, the Ptolemaic version of the universe that everything revolved around the earth, right? Um, Galileo has a heliocentric view of the world where um, everything revolves or even not revolves, what is it? Rotates around the sun. So of course we know that's what happens, but during this time period, they're debating, they're debating who is right. Um, these ideas have been introduced and have challenged the Ptolemaic universe. Um, and John Donne is very much engaging um, in that debate, but in a poetic way for his own use, using his metaphysical conceit. So he's using that Ptolemaic um, viewpoint of, of life to make a poetic point about love. Um, so busy old fool, unruly son, why dost thou thus through windows and through curtains call upon us? So he's, he's personifying the son as um, someone who is a pedant, so saucy pedantic wretch, go chide late schoolboys and sour apprentices. Um, apprentices, people who must get up and move off to work um, and go do their job. He says, go, go mess with people that need to be on time. We don't need to be on time. We're in bed and we're enjoying each other. Um, and he's directly addressing the sun as if they, it is trying to interrupt. Um, he's saying, son, go tell the court huntsman that the king will ride, which is the, of course, this is a reference to James the first, um, who was known for riding horses, um, call country ants to harvest offices, love all alike, no season knows, nor climb, nor hours, days, months, which are the rags of time. Um, he's saying all these other things like ants who need to know the seasons, the passage of time, um, um, you know, court huntsmen that are reliant upon the sunrise and the sunset to hunt. Um, those people um, are responsible for following the passage of time and the rising of the sun, but not love doesn't follow days. Um, love knows no season or climate, doesn't keep watch, it doesn't follow a calendar, um, it, it shows the rags of time. Um, love is um, So here, this this thing here, it says rags of time, a figure of speech, meaning that such things are passing in immaterial hours, days, months are rags of time. Um, and, and love is not, you know, um, love, love doesn't follow those rules. By being so revered and strong, and this is where the Ptolemaic universe comes in because the, the sun is outside the window, the bed is the center of the universe with um, his lover. Um, why shouldst thou think I could eclipse and cloud them with a wink, but that if I would not lose her sight so long, if her eyes had not blinded thine. So his lover becomes the center of the universe. Um, and again, he's collapsing geographic space as Marvell does, um, both the Indias and spice of mine, um, be outside, um, or lie with me. So all the greatest thing, it doesn't matter. It's in, that's the center of the universe. The riches are within the bed. 
All right, and so here's a very famous um, piece of metaphysical conceit. She's all states and all princes I, which go along with um, that great chain of being I was talking about, um, you know, that she's all states, her body, herself. Um, he rules over her all princes I, nothing else is, nothing else matters. Princes do play us compared to this, all honors mimic all wealth alchemy. So all these things are immaterial. They are created. Nothing is as real as this relationship here. So he's centering the relationship. Um, and then he speaks to the sun again. Um, thine age ask ease and since thy duties be to warm the world that's done in warming us. He's saying you are actually um, in my power because you your job is to warm me. Um, so shine on us and, and everywhere. Um, the bed is the center of the, of the world and the walls are your sphere. So um, he's centering his love um, and that the universe is, is um, you know, outside of this window um, and doesn't or not the universe the, the time and everything else is outside his window and time stands still within the bed all right that's enough for today um and i will um do a lecture on um marvel or on um dr faustus later um, and upload that. I'm hoping to do it this weekend. Um, and then um, I'll upload that. Okay.